Now we return to local news and sport with joy. Tottenham Hotspur fans face an agonising wait to learn if they will move to Stratford after the Olympic Park Legacy Company delayed a decision until March. The OPLC board was due to announce its preferred bidder on Friday, January the 28th, but said it needed more time to weigh up the benefits between Spurs' vision and West Ham United's rival bid backed by Newham Council. Edmonton MP Andy Love is backing the campaign to keep the Premiership Club in North London as it has a considerable fan base in his constituency. He said, I have been contacted by a lot of constituents who are Spurs fans. None favours a move to East London. I hope the Olympic Park Legacy Company will use the extra time it has prescribed itself to ensure it keeps its promise to retain athletics at Stratford and in doing so ensure many more years of football will be played at White Hart Lane where Tottenham belongs. Mr Love said Spurs' departure would leave a vacuum in the area as residents depended on the club not just for football but also for jobs and other community support. Enfield Town returned to form in some style as they eased to a 4-0 win at home to Ware on Saturday. Town had lost by an identical scoreline against Ryman Division 1 North leaders, East Thurrock United, in their previous outing, but they banished the memories of that defeat by overwhelming their in-form visitors. A John Moore goal, his third in his many games since returning to the club last month, gave Town the lead at the interval. But it was in the second half that the hosts really cut loose as Liam Hope, Liam Ose and Adam Wallace all found the net before former towner and Ware skipper Matthew Mitchell was sent off. It was a very good day for us, said manager Steve Newing, not just because of the result, but it was an excellent performance as well. It was important to put the East Thurrock match well and truly behind us, and we certainly managed to do that. That result could have knocked us a bit, but I suppose having two weeks without a match allowed us to clear our heads a bit. Ware have hit a bit of a purple patch as well, and it could have been a tricky match if we weren't on our game. Newing added, Before Saturday, we had only won three out of ten league games at home, which is not good enough, and we hadn't kept a clean sheet in 18 games, which is not good enough either, but we managed to rectify both of those on the same day. Although Town dominated much of the first half, they had to wait until the 28th minute to take the lead when Wallace, crossed from the right and Richard Morton's nod down, was swept home by Moore. Ware started the second half in positive fashion, but they were undone on the hour mark when Oze put in a good ball to the near post, which Hope clipped into the roof of the net. And any doubt over the result was ended when Town struck twice in as many minutes. Jose grabbed a fine individual third on 73, embarking on a jinking run before unleashing a fierce shot, which gave keeper Obey Murafu no, Murafu no chance, and Wallace rounded off the scoring with a low shoot from the edge of the box soon after. Essex senior league leaders Enfield were denied the opportunity to build on last Tuesday's excellent 3-0 win at home to second-place Bethnal Green United when Saturday's scheduled match at Bowers and Pitsley was postponed. Ben Andrios, Neil Hughes and Russ Williamson were on target in the victory over Bethnal Green, which enabled the E's to open up a ten-point lead at the top of the table, although Bethnal Green's win at the weekend saw that advantage cut to seven. Enfield, who were due to visit reigning champion Stansted last night, host Barking on Saturday at 3pm before going to Southend Manor on Tuesday for a 7.45pm kick-off. Saracen's difficult Heineken Cup campaign came to an end with another defeat as they were beaten 24-14 at home to Clermont Auvergne on Friday. Although an injury hit Sarri's side held their own against the French champions for much of the contest, they eventually came away empty-handed for their efforts as they were outscored by four tries to one. Wesley Fofana, Willie Weppener, Tassia Lavia and T. Paolo all crossed the line for the visitors while David Strettle scored Saracen's only try with the other points coming from three Owen Farrell penalties. Saracen's director of rugby, Mark McCall, said the final scoreline makes it look like we were beaten comfortably, but that was far from the case. Also at Saracen's, prop Richard Skews has been forced to retire from professional rugby on specialist advice after failing to recover from a neck injury he suffered in November. 
Meanwhile, England international prop Matt Stevens, who joined the club last week on the completion of his two-year drugs ban for cocaine use, made his first appearance for Saracens for their second-string Storm team against Wasps on Monday night. The advertiser would like to clarify a couple of points made in last week's edition in an article about Palmer's Green High School plan for a new hall. The new building, which will be 28 feet tall, is two storeys, not three, as stated. It will also include two flats to replace the two bungalows in the grounds. Although it was included in the article, as requested, we would like to point out that the residents of the bungalows were not evicted, but left in accordance with the terms of their tenancy agreement. A contract to run a major new supermarket distribution centre in Enfield will bring 550 jobs into, this, into the area. Tes Tesco has signed a deal worth £20 million with logistics firm Gaisley for its new centre in G Park, a 15.5-acre business complex off Mollison Avenue. The centre is already under construction and is due to be opened later this year, serving North London and the home counties. Lord Tebbit, Enfield's very own elder statesman, has got the hump with his party's co-chairwoman, Baroness Worsey. After her well-publicised speech about anti-Muslim prejudice, Lord Tebbit, quoting Clem Attlee, requests a period of silence from his uh, comrade. Many people will be surprised to find themselves being lectured about racism by a Tory, but then the Church of England was once known as the Conservative Party at Prayer. Maybe Baroness Worsey dreams of turning the Muslim community into the Conservative Party at the mosque. Years ago, when I was a young socialist, the people who made up the British establishment were easily identifiable. We called them the ruling class. They were all, without exception, old white men with posh voices. What fun we used to have, mimicking their accents and their mannerisms. It was more fun than reading what Karl Marx had to say about the roots of their wealth and power. Capitalism has changed, it has globalised, and the ruling class has changed and globalised too. Those pillars of British capitalism, the Premier League football clubs, have almost as many foreign billionaires as foreign players. The British establishment now includes women, ethnic minorities and gay men in its ranks, along with more traditional types, such as Lord Tebbit. And Baroness Worsey? She co-chairs a party which sat on its hands while Tony Blair was invading Iraq. And she draws a ministerial salary and a government which is waging war on Afghanistan. She is on the same side as Lord Tebbit and on the opposite side to most of us, Muslim and non-Muslims alike. A natural wildlife habitat has been flattened by network rail to the fury of residents living in Grange Park. Over the past two weeks, the rail company has cleared down a wooded area next to the railway on the boundary with Green Dragon Lane, Deep Dean Court, Merry Dean and the Grange Way, without any public consultation. As well as the tragic loss of habitat for birds, squirrels and other creatures, it also means residents have less protection from the sight and sound of trains. It has also heightened fears that Network Rail might, might be planning on increasing the number of heavy freight trains that pass through the area, or planning to concrete the entire area. In a letter to residents, an action group called the Grange Park Residents wrote, Network Rail carried out these works without informing most residents. A vague letter was sent to a few households in December, and without providing a clear explanation of the nature or purpose of the works. Since they have not communicated with the community, we have no evidence that they have taken any steps at all to minimise the impact of the works on the area, or even considered residents at all. Nor do we have any real idea for the reason for the works. The group has now taken the case to Enfield Southgate MP David Burrows, who's arranging a public meeting with Network Rail. A statement from Network Rail said, the management of trees and other vegetation on Network Rail land is vital for ensuring the ongoing stability of our railway embankments, especially in residential areas where gardens back directly on to the operational railway. We would only ever remove those trees which pose a risk to the safe and efficient running of the railway. Without this scheme, rail passengers could face delays to their journeys from speed restrictions due to the unstable nature of the railway embankments. Ultimately, if left untreated, we could see a situation where a train is derailed because of unpredictable and unexpected earth movements. 
Residents will understand we cannot let this happen. Education chiefs have warned two Enfield schools on track to become academies that they could lose funding if they sign an agreement with unions over pay and conditions for their staff. In a letter to head teachers at Kingsmead School in Southbury Road and Cuckoo Hall Primary in Cuckoo Hall Lane, the Department of Education said there was no requirement for the schools to promise to retain national pay and conditions of support staff. It includes all non-teaching roles, including teaching assistants, mentors, admin staff and technical support. The letter added, The existence of any such agreement will be a significant factor in the assessment the Secretary of State will make before deciding whether or not to enter into a funding agreement for an academy. However, the letter has angered the General Trade Union, the GMB, which acts for school support staff. It described the letter as shameful and urged its members to get in touch in order to protect their jobs and avoid pay cuts. Avril Chambers, the GMB national lead organiser for school support staff, said head teachers could also face legal action if they did not consult with staff. She said, This is shameful and the advice should be ignored by all schools. In our opinion, this advice is misleading at best and unlawful at worst. We are advising staff in schools that have or are becoming academies to contact GMB immediately so it can advise staff on what they need to do to protect their position. Staff have a legal right to maintain their current pay, hours and terms and conditions. Kingsmead and Cuckoo Hall were approved to apply for academy status last year after being considered outstanding by Ofsted inspectors. A rogue builder who admitted taking thousands of pounds from an Oakwood pensioner for poor work on her driveway could be jailed. Felix Rooney was hauled before the courts when Enfield Trading Standards discovered poor quality work he had done on driveways in the borough. Woodgreen Crown Court heard how one elderly lady handed over £5,200 for shoddy work on her drive in Oakwood and another parted with £2,500. Rooney, who lives on a caravan site in south-west London, pleaded guilty to false representation, giving misleading information and omitting information. He will be sentenced on Friday, February the 18th, and was told he could face time behind bars. Councillor Chris Bond, Cabinet Member for Environment at Enfield Council, welcomed the conviction and pledged trading standard officers would seek to recover the money he got from residents. Health bosses have admitted they have a massive problem in a £180 million hole in next year's budget. The scale of the deficit at health trusts across Barnet, Harringay, Enfield, Islington and Camden was revealed on Thursday as Chiefs try to plug this year's multi-million pound gap in its budget. Plans have been drawn up to save a possible £122 million in 2011 and 2012 but bosses admitted the plans fall well short of balancing the books, and even those savings are not guaranteed to come off. Nigel Beverley, Chief Executive of National Health Service Enfield, said, Clearly we have a massive problem. It's obvious. The missing piece of the jigsaw is we are likely, still likely to have a gap this year, even with the best results, so we need innovation. We have a responsibility to hand over to GPs a balanced position. That has got to be the fundamental objective. The deteriorating financial situation at the Trusts, which have banded together to form the North Central London NHS sector, was laid bare by Anne Johnson, Director of Finance, who said this year's latest figures show a £24.8 million overspend with a third of the year to go. She said the situation wasn't getting worse. The Health Trusts are still heading towards a £35 million overspend as expected, but she warned urgent action was to be taken to deal with next year's finances. Richard Sumray, Chief Executive of NHS Haringey, said of this year's position, it is a huge challenge in its own right and still getting on to £60 million short of where we need to be and urged his colleagues not to let their foot off the pedal at all. The plans for next year include a raft of money-saving proposals, foremost of which is dramatically reducing spending on acute hospital services by more than £74 million. 
Negotiations are underway with hospitals across the sector, as well as with mental health trusts and community health services, to negotiate scaled-down contracts, which are more cost-effective. The health trusts are facing abolition in 2013, with their health commissioning function taken over by GP consortiums, and Thursday's sector board meeting agreed to place the owners on hospitals to deliver sustainable savings plans that can be taken over by doctors in two years' time. Anita Charlesworth, Vice Chairman of North National Health Service Islington, told colleagues she is profoundly worried about the numbers and urged for a greater focus on getting the finances under control. She said there are a heck of a lot of areas where there are undoubtedly high, highly attractive ideas, but they don't get us to financial balance. The focus we ought to see is on financial balance. The Mayor of London has promised a swift improvement on a tube line plagued by problems. Complaints almost doubled by passengers on the Victoria Line between mid-October and mid-November last year, compared with the previous month, leading to accusations it had become the misery line on the underground. Trains were stuck in sweltering temperatures following repeated problems with doors not opening or closing, and in one instance a breakdown meant the train was evacuated and passengers had to be led down the line to Seven Sisters Station. Mayor Boris Johnson admitted there had been serious problems with new trains introduced onto the line as part of the upgrade programme, but insisted the initial teething problems would soon be ironed out. He said there was a big problem with super-sensitive doors, which is being fixed, and I think there are grounds for optimism. Clearly, when you are improving a 153-year-old system, there are going to be difficulties, delays, and people will feel the pressure of it. But this aggravation will be worth it in the long run, and the Victoria Line will be much better in the future. Mr Johnson was pressed on the matter on Wednesday the 19th of January by Enfield and Haringey Assembly member Joanne McCartney, who asked for reassurance the problems were being solved. The mayor admitted inadequate testing had been carried out on the new trains, but blamed this on a contractor not carrying out the work. Ms McCartney, speaking after the meeting, accused the mayor of taking his eye off the ball with the Victoria Line and said she would continue to monitor progress to ensure the problems did not continue. An Enfield man has been jailed for his part in a fake cigarette smuggling operation involving the Italian Mafia. Terence Borum, 49, of Meadway, Enfield, was sentenced to four and a half years for his part in a gang which trafficked £64 million pounds worth of cigarettes into the UK, evading £10 million pounds worth in duty. Borum's role was to shift the fake goods around the country. Ringleader Peter Vise a market trader from Waltham Cross, was jailed for seven years at Southwark Crown Court. The gang was smashed after customs seized nine million cigarettes hidden in consignments of glass, fruit juice, pickled vegetables and dog food between November 2007 and June 2008. The, ship the shipments were arranged by Vise, who travelled extensively to Greece and Romania with the goods made in Moldova and Ukraine. Dennis Lynch acted as a courier for the dirty money, much of which officials believe is ploughed back into criminal activities and helped move the goods round the country. He has been jailed for three and a half years, along with eight other people, last Wednesday, January the 19th. John Cooper from HMRC said, This was a daring attempt to rip off smokers and taxpayers by flooding the UK with millions of counterfeit cigarettes. With expertly crafted packaging, it can be difficult to spot fake cigarettes. But like any other counterfeit product, you have no idea exactly what you're buying. Tobacco smuggling is organised crime on a global scale, with huge profits ploughed straight back into the criminal underworld. Our next step will be to recover the profits from their illegal activities. Anyone with information about this type of criminal activity can contact Customs Hotline 0800 59 5000. Younger women in Enfield are now eligible for breast screening thanks to new technology at a North London Health Trust. Barnes and Chase Farm Hospital last year decided to invest £2 million on digital X ray equipment for the North London Breast Screening Service at Edgware Community Hospital. The new machines, which produce more precise digital images, 
have enabled doctors to lower the age of women invited for screening from 50 to 47. Early detection of breast cancer is vital to increasing chances of survival and the new X-ray can spot cancerous cells at a very early stage, sometimes before the symptoms have emerged. The service is open to women from Barnet, Brent, Enfield, Haringey, Harrow and West Hertfordshire and those ages between 47 and 49 will be gradually invited for a screening over the next six years. A fascinating piece of history shedding new light on wartime London has been discovered at Southgate Police Station. The 70-year-old logbook documenting the actions of duty officers between 1939 and 1943 was uncovered during a routine spring clean and draws a vivid picture of what life, life was like at the time. The Occurrences book includes a list of reported air raids and the special constables whose task it was to raise the alarm and alert the community of enemy aircraft. On a lighter note, there is also an entry from Chief Inspector J.A. Millian recording the incident of an escaping cart horse. The entry, dated August 16, 1940, reads... At 7.10pm, whilst proceeding along McDonnell Road, North 11, I saw a pair of heavy van horses attached to a heavy coal cart owned by the London Corporation Society, New Southgate branch, galloping along the road towards me, driverless. I immediately ran after them and seized the reins and guided them round the corner into Goldsmith Road, eventually bringing them to a standstill. Inspector Ian Clark of the Safer Neighbourhoods team said, we found this book after a much-needed clear-out of Southgate Police Station and I was astonished something as important as this had lain hidden all this time. It is a fascinating read and forms part of the history of policing in Enfield. As well as entries about duties, siren warnings and crime, a typed letter dating September the 29th, 1942 was found in between the pages of the book in response to a request from Mr. R.G. Chamkin to join the police. His request was made at a time when the borough was policed by volunteers because most officers had joined the armed forces to support the war effort. Chief Superintendent David Tucker, borough commander of Enfield, said, This book shows special constables provide an invaluable resource to the Metropolitan Police. It reflects the important role they played in helping to keep the, this borough safe. It clearly shows they made a significant impact on providing public reassurance. Today, they continue to do so and are necessary in order for us to continue our fight against crime. Budding chefs from Southgate College have cooked up a feast to promote healthy eating. Taste of Edmonton Open Air Food Festival took place on Friday afternoon in the Concourse Edmonton Green Shopping Centre with students' chefs demonstrating their recipes for simple and nutritious meals. They used fresh ingredients donated by local greengrocers, fishmongers and butchers. The event was to promote the talents of the students and celebrate the diversity of Edmonton's small businesses. David Byrne, Southgate College principal, said, This is a great opportunity, combining a strong message that healthy meals can be simple to prepare with providing value, valuable experience for the students taking part. I hope this will also prove an inspiration to others to eat more healthily and take advantage of opportunities to improve their cooking skills. We're proud to be associated with the event. The festival is the brainchild of Enfield Council in partnership with Southgate College, Edmonton Green Shopping Centre owners St Moden and the North London Chamber representing traders including Mamara Fisheries, Bizim Kassap, Archer's Quality Fruit and Veg, Café Doro and Maori Stores Ethnic Groceries who all donated food. As well as encouraging shoppers to eat healthily, the budding chefs challenge them to try food they may not have considered eating before. Roger Allen, the manager of Edmonton Green Shopping Centre, said, At Edmonton Green, we pride ourselves in having traders who can provide the very best fresh produce, and it's great that this can contribute to the work being done for the Enfield Food Strategy. The strategy, launched in August last year, was designed to raise the profile of locally sourced produce and small businesses with an emphasis on teaching good eating habits and reminding local residents that Enfield is one of the greenest boroughs in London. Councillor Del Goddard, Cabinet Member for Regeneration, said there's a long history of food production in the borough, so inviting residents and shoppers to come along and try, then try again at home. Taste of Edmonton took place in the concourse at Edmonton Green Shopping Centre on Friday the 28th of January.
Top politicians are urging the government to speed up introducing new laws to tackle dangerous dogs. The London Assembly passed a motion last week backing a campaign for tougher action on dangerous dogs and urged the government to take immediate action to bring in stiffer penalties for dog owners. Joanne McCartney, Assembly member for Enfield, said, I'm sure all of us receive increasing numbers of cases of problems in parks. This summer, in my local park, they were stripping the lower branches off trees because dogs are trained to hang off them. There's also a financial implication. We are currently going through the police budget and £10 million this year was spent on putting dogs into kennels. I hope the government is looking at this and will speed up the process of dealing with prosecutions through the courts because that's money that could be spent on other things. The approved motion said, This Assembly supports the campaign calling for stronger action to tackle the increasing problem of dangerous dogs. We welcome the dangerous dogs petition, which calls on the government to take immediate action to deal with this problem. We also support the Mayor in lobbying for an urgent review of the current legislation regarding dangerous dogs, with the aim of introducing stiffer penalties and tougher legislation to protect the public. This Assembly resolves to lobby the Government to acknowledge dangerous dogs are used as weapons and that they should be treated as such in parliamentary legislation. The Government is currently looking at the issue with a view to refreshing the law on dangerous dogs to reflect the growing problem of poor ownership and dogs being used as weapons. A duck has won a life and death battle after getting a fishing hook stuck in his head while swimming in a pond in Enfield's Trent Park. The bird was rescued on Tuesday, January the 18th, by Barry Smitherman, NBE, who founded the Wildlife Rescue and Ambulance Crew Service with his wife 11 years ago. Mr Smitherman said, It was touch and go whether the duck would survive, but he made a full recovery. Fortunately, the hook got caught in the skin, and so his injuries were not more severe. And like most wild creatures, he wanted to go right back to his natural habitat. The animal lover said the story was all too familiar in Trent Park. He added, This happens far too often. People leave their fishing equipment and just show a total disregard for the waterfowl. If anyone spots anything that might be dangerous, Trent Park has wardens who can help. And we've reached the end of our programme for this week. Thanks very much for listening. So from the team of Joy, Jenny, John, Philip and Robin on the controls, it's goodbye. Goodbye. Please remember to turn over the address label in your postal packet, put the cassette into the packet and return it to us as soon as possible in readiness for the next edition. Don't forget you can call Diane de Jersey regarding any help you may require in connection with the Enfield Talking Newspaper. The Enfield Talking Newspaper will be with you again in one week's time.